right now finding a cure for Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases like ALS and Parkinson's. Um, pharmaceutical companies are failing us. Science is failing us. Um, the system and the process that we're using is failing us. We started thinking there's got to be a better way. What we've done here is we've created a virtual pharmaceutical firm. I mean, we're frankly in a cabin here. Our laboratory is cabin-based, okay? Um, we have not invested in brick and mortar. We have a consortium of more than 50 scientists around the world, and each of them are top in their fields. These are the best of the best. We have literally told them to stop what you're doing and come and help us solve neurodegenerative disease. That's what this place is about. A different place, a way to think different thoughts with the smartest people I can find on this planet to come up with innovative new drugs to treat our most serious illnesses. My name is Paul Allen Cox. I'm executive director of the Brain Chemistry Labs in Jackson, Wyoming. I go to indigenous peoples. I study both their traditional healing systems, but I also just study different patterns of disease. And that's what led us into our current work now on ALS and Alzheimer's disease. When my mother passed away from breast cancer in 1983, I got a year to go with my family to a remote island in Samoa where I apprenticed with native healers. I failed fast. I discovered that the people did not even have a word in their language for cancer. But when the National Cancer Institute asked me to start looking for something that could treat HIV AIDS, we found this remarkable bark of this tree that the healers were using to treat hepatitis and we discovered a new drug for HIV. So I started thinking, what could I do? What other sort of indication could I look at? Where there's sort of hopelessness, no good drugs. That led me straight into ALS and Alzheimer's disease. Guam is an island in the South Pacific. It changed hands during World War II. The Chamorro people, the indigenous people, were under uh, famine conditions prior to the United States taking it back from Japan. What's unique about the Chamorro people, um, besides their isolation, they eat bats, they eat flying foxes. And this is a, a unique, it's not completely unique, but it has become part of their cultural identity. We learned that the people, the Chamorim people, have this devastating disease, um, which has aspects of ALS, which is Lou Gehrig's disease, it had aspects of Alzheimer's, and it has aspects of Parkinson's disease, and, and many times all in a single individual. I was sitting on the beach in Samoa thinking about this unusual disease among the Chamorro people which again looks sometimes like ALS, sometimes like Parkinson's, sometimes like Alzheimer's. I was trying to figure out how those people get enough of a dose uh, to, to cause a disease. And suddenly I realized, wait, maybe it's the consumption of the flying foxes that cause this illness. So that was the first real sort of flash of, of, of I guess, insight. This intrigued, intrigued us of whether the bats themselves could be part of the, this unique disease that they have known as ALS-PDC. We realized here's a big piece of the puzzle that's been missed. Uh, and then we discovered that the flying foxes feed on the fleshy covering of cycad seeds and that way absorb this toxin from the cycads. Cycad seeds have a variety of different toxic substances. So we decided first to look at this weird amino acid, BMAA. I remember putting in the sample and, and saw this little peak come up and realized that the bats had this toxin present in their tissue. And I was so excited. It was two in the morning and I was thinking, do I call Dr. Cox or not? The phone rang two in the morning. I picked it up in the first ring. She said, we got it. I said, you're kidding? She said, no, I can see the peak as clear as anything. Here's this peak of BMAA from this flying fox tissue. So it was really the bats that led us to this toxin. Cycads are very old organisms. Um, they were around when the dinosaurs were around. But what's really intriguing about cycads is they have um, these specialized roots and most roots grow into the ground and down. What these ones do is they grow up. And within these roots, there is a bacteria that lives in specialized cells that the cycad makes in its roots. And, and these um, photosynthetic bacteria, known as cyanobacteria, move in. We wondered if it wasn't cyanobacteria itself that produced the toxin. There's fossils of cyanobacteria that date back to 3.4 billion years ago. 
They created the oxygen atmosphere of this planet. So they're not our enemies. Um, on the other hand, they produce some toxic substances, including this one, VMAA. Cyanobacteria is ubiquitous. It's found in fresh water. It's found in salt water. It's found in ice cores. It it's, brings the color of Yellowstone National Park. And if this toxin is found in, in the larger cyanobacteria and is found worldwide in all these places, then everybody could be exposed to it. The Chamorro people had a very high exposure, but it certainly is possible that the rest of us had some small, lower concentration of exposure, no matter where we live in the world. So suddenly the picture starts getting much more complex because we're not talking about a single tribal disease among a remote island population. We're talking about people that live in Sweden along the Baltic. We're talking about Toledo, Ohio. You could be down sitting along the St. Lucie River coming out of Lake Okeechobee in Florida and be exposed to that exact same toxin. That was terrifying to us. I started thinking, well, I've been to all the places in the world that have an elevated incidence of ALS and Alzheimer's. I wonder if there's anywhere where they don't have it at all. This took me to Ogimi on the northern tip of Okinawa, where they have no record of ALS, no record of Alzheimer's, no record of Parkinson's. And we were astonished to discover their, their diet is rich in l -serine. They get it from the tofu they eat, they get it from the seaweeds, other plants. To put this in perspective, the average American gets about three grams of l uh, in their diet a day. The average resident of that village gets 10 to 12 grams four times the amount. Maybe if you increase the concentration of serine in your diet relative to the BMAA or to other amino acids in your diet, that you could save neurons from death. What if serine all by itself can protect us from these neurodegenerative diseases? I hate to get my hopes up, but I'll, but I'll tell you, if it really does work, if we can really slow both ALS and Alzheimer's through high doses of L-serine, that would be terrific because this stuff is cheap. I mean, you can buy it off the internet at 30 bucks a kilogram, you know. It's abundant. If we're successful using a non-toxic molecule to reduce risk of protein misfolding and hence risk of Alzheimer's disease, we just think we should treat everybody. Whether they show any signs of Alzheimer's or not, what's to lose? You know, science is such a powerful way of understanding the universe. It's a terrific way of viewing the world. But when we couple modern science with indigenous knowledge that goes back, in some cases, hundreds or even thousands of years, combining those two results in a very powerful way of discovering new drugs. I think brain chemistry labs can change the world. I think if we're right, and, and this is an if, we, we still have a lot of work to do, but if we're right, we can prevent neurodegenerative disease. Our sole mission here is to change patient outcomes. And we want to change it in the lifetime of current patients. We don't want them waiting 30, 40, 50 years. We want to change outcomes now. I was so excited this afternoon. I got word from Dartmouth that they dosed the first ALS patient. 50 people. And when you see the patients and the agony they and their families face with these diseases, to think that we've even got a small chance of treating this, that's a big payoff for us. I've told the team, you know, that if we actually succeed in getting one of these drugs licensed by the FDA, well, we're gonna take the day off and go ski the powder. <laughs> and then the following day, we'll be right back here working on the next disease.